So I hope, yes, we are going live now. I'm super thrilled uh, to run this session here at Horace's extraordinary meeting on March 18th. We are waiting a little bit to get everyone here on track. And uh, but with me, I'm I'm super, super happy to um, have today with me at least already Kohai Kurihara. Uh, he is the co-founder of Privacy by Design Lab in Japan and also the president of the Tokyo chapter of the Government Blockchain Association. Super, super happy to have you with me. We met various times uh, in at various conferences already in our life uh, in the blockchain space. And uh, I'm looking forward to at least also exchange with you on this topic, which is more important than ever in how the, in, in this time where everything has changed since uh, COVID-19. And uh, thank you to, for joining us. And thank you for Horace's of making this all possible. Kohai, uh, please maybe first start introducing yourself a little bit uh, that the guests get an idea of your extensive experience. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, I'm also the very great honor to be uh, participating in these sessions. Um, so my name is Kohei. I'm uh, running the Privacy Design Lab, uh, which is the uh, developing the privacy park cultures in a Japanese market. I think uh, uh, this theme I trusted is one of the uh, uh, very important uh, topic uh, for the digital world because uh, we were uh, living on the digital age um, almost uh, some decades. Uh, however, the digital uh, technology is a turning point at this moment uh, because um, we, uh, we are in a very um, significance of these times, not just using the technologies, but also seeking the uh, um, prosperity of the world. So that's why I'm just started to work on the privacy matters, uh, besides on the blockchain and decentralized um, networks. So this time I'm very great to join the sessions and having uh, important topics with uh, all of yours. Yes. I see Ramesh Raska is is with us here. Are you? Can you hear us, Ramesh? One second. He's asking for getting. I gave him the mic. Oh yes, wonderful, wonderful, Ramesh. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> we are so happy to awesome. have you with us. <laughs> So, Ramesh, we just uh, started because we saw the other panels were also starting. So glad to have you with us. Um, let's jump immediately in. Kohai already introduced himself, um, and I would be very happy if you could also start introducing yourself first. Oh, we cannot hear you. I think your mic. Let me see. Is it? switched on i mean it is one second maybe you're muted somewhere it's just about your mic to getting things started but i see here everything is online you're definitely on stage with us Okay, we need to start this again. I hope Ramesh is joining us soon. But uh, yeah, here he's asking again. Ramesh, are you joining here? Yes. For some reason, we can still not hear you. Now? 
Oh. No. No. Um, let me see. I gave him again the mic. I'm really sorry. He has challenges to join. We were now so happy to have uh, Ramesh with us, Associate Professor of MIT Media Labs. He for sure has so much to contribute. I don't know, Ramesh, It's still not, we cannot hear you. Ramesh, you're, the very important part is that you're, um, once you have set your, your, your microphone, it's kind of set. Mm. It's a setting issue. It's probably a setting issue. But you can hear us, I guess. It's yeah oh. okay. That's that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> but Ramesh won so many awards, countless awards. I <laughs> I was so happy to have you with us and um, discuss this topic. Well, quite. I mean, but maybe we can start, you know, with uh, Japan because this was also very interesting to see. I think, especially in times like these where we have seen. I mean, the digital world has kind of grown exponentially, especially due uh, to this global crisis. And um, yeah, it's, it's of course more important than ever to discuss um, how can we trust each other digitally? Um, how can also, or what kind of measurements were now taken also in certain regions to um, trust the data, to trust each other digitally? So how is it currently the situation in Japan? Very interested to hear this. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So yeah, Terry is with us too. Great, Terry. Yeah, awesome. Good to see you. <laughs> awesome. Can you hear me, by the way? Oh, okay. Yes, oh, we can hear you. you, unfortunately, so far. Uh, Ramesh, can we now hear yeah. you too? Yeah, you, you can hear me? Good, excellent. Oh, yes, awesome, awesome. perfect. <laughs> now we are here. Wonderful, yeah. okay. Great. Uh, so it took uh, a little bit to get you all on board, but now we have you. So, so happy to hear. Uh, maybe, Kohai, let's uh, pause this question for a second and just let um, Ramesh and Terry really join us. And uh, so happy to see you here. Happy to host this panel. Uh, Ramesh, we are super keen to hear a little bit more about your background. I already told everyone, I mean, endless rewards uh, and the professor of MIT Media Lab. So please let us know what's your background, what brought you here? Thank you. Thank you, Mihir. And so wonderful to be with you, um, uh, with all of you. Um, you know, the topic today is about, you know, privacy and trust uh, in, in COVID. And we live in a world where we have a trade-off between privacy and utility of data. On, on one extreme, we use you know applications like Google Maps, and we willingly give away our location to Google, willingly give up our privacy, and Google gives us great benefits in return, like showing where we are on the map, showing us where the traffic is, and showing us everywhere everybody else is. When it comes to health data, uh, we don't do that. We, you know, we uh, all this very important data. We don't share it because of privacy or regulation, uh, and that makes it very challenging to uh, do anything meaningful uh, with that data. So we live in this world where we either have privacy or have utility. Uh, a lot of the work we are doing here at MIT and you know many of you out there is trying to break this trade off. How can we create privacy preserving computation uh, on health data? And in the middle of COVID, this has become very important. If you just take an example of contact tracing of who comes in contact with who, uh, that's a very sensitive information. Uh, and traditional contact tracing requires, you know, call centers, making phone calls and gathering this extremely invasive information. Uh, but using, you know, techniques like Bluetooth based, you know, exposure notification, 
it's possible to create a contact tracing system that's automatic uh, and doesn't really you know impede uh, the personal liberty and freedom and if we do the same thing with vaccination today uh, is the same challenge it feels like we have to give up all our privacy we have to enter our name and date of birth and race and occupation all of that on some random website run by some you know small health it company just to get vaccinated uh, and that is that may be okay for you know 60 70% of the population but the last 30% uh, is going to be very uh, allergic to uh, such an experience they're going to delay as much as they can you know some people are fearful of law enforcement think about many countries where residents are not really fan of giving all the information uh, just to get uh, vaccination um, to their governments or you know other law enforcement entities uh, so i think it's it's very important to solve this privacy versus uh, utility uh, trade off uh, we have seen this in cryptocurrencies on one hand where you can do either anonymization or pseudo anonymizations to create an experience but when it comes to health you know we haven't done a very good job uh, and so i think if we can overcome these issues uh, of privacy and utility uh, by creating new computational methods we can go a long way so a lot of our work uh, at mit has been on this uh, distributed and private uh, machine learning uh, and we launched uh, you know a couple of nonprofits one is called uh, pathcheck foundation uh, p a t h c h e c k dot org and a path check foundation allows uh, you know uh, the world to build open source and free software uh, to deal with covid and very quickly it has become the world's largest open source effort uh, for covid-19 and you know we raised a few million dollars and has hired a fantastic team to take this forward amazing amazing terry um thanks for joining us uh, today um super happy to have you with us especially as you are definitely a man who is living in uh, all you know diverse cultures and you have served um to build amazon in 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 europe and also alibaba um so you really know uh the diverse uh, cultures between east and west very very well I guess you have also experienced uh, different handling, different measurements um, with, uh, yeah, how we can trust each other digitally. Um, thanks for joining us. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, and uh, pleasure and honor to be here with the group. I apologize for my delay. I did get caught by the uh, the time shift, um, so I'm glad that that's that's all worked out. So. Um, yeah, you know, my background, Amazon, um, back when Amazon started uh, here in Europe, and then um, uh, obviously that was an important topic then and for that company. At Yahoo, my role was um, in digital media where this is an incredibly important time, and this was when a lot of the things started, um, be it when um, Facebook was launched uh, during my time at Yahoo and really changed the advertising space and the whole move to um, – much more sophisticated advertising via technology and via data happened back then. Uh, and we were very much in the middle of it. Um, this was also the time when um, things happened in terms of getting people's permission. So the way we're now all asked to uh, approve cookies on sites, um, we were doing the first tests along those lines 10 years ago on, on Yahoo. Um, to start, I mean, how could we ask people and does it be optional um, would it ruin the business model? And a lot of those discussions. Um, and at Alibaba, um, a lot of my work, of course, involved how do you help a a Chinese company set up business in a completely different set of markets, in this case, in the European markets? Um, and how do you help bridge the different understandings, um, different acceptance rates, different regulatory environments uh, that come to um, come into play? So it's it's a very interesting it's a very close subject to my heart um i would say just in terms of a few thoughts in, in terms of introduction and then obviously love to have a discussion um but when i think about the changes um in this topic over the last 15 years you know the development of technology that would enable us to better track what people do in both directions as a foundation for trust has grown incredibly and so that would actually lead to a situation where you could say, you know, the famous quote, um, trust is good, control is better, or trust 
there's actually gone in the other direction. Um, and, and we have to think about, uh, happy to discuss, why is that? Why is a, the better ability to measure what people are doing and hold them to what they say they're doing and what they say they will not do because we can hasn't led to more trust. And I think it's, um, I think it's partly because this is very much out of balance. People assume, so let's say consumers and users assume the bad actors will be able to better use technology and will know more about it than we do as normal users. So there's an assumption out there, the bad actors can better use technology to harm us than we can use technology to protect ourselves. Whether that's accurate or fair and different for every market can be, but that's out there and the perception of it is very strong. So even though um, users want to know why someone's using technology, they want to know how they're using technology, um, but in the end, um, they will always feel like this is changing so quickly that the people who spend criminal energy on using it will be able to do a better job of understanding it and using it against the, against them. And that that has come up in, in in so many different cases. When you look at the um, you know the Cambridge Analytica case back in my time at Yahoo, this was when targeting ads became very commonplace. And we had a, a value proposition that was actually quite simple. The value proposition was give us your data and we will give you good personalized services for free in exchange or give us your data and we will give you personalized targeted advertising and services in exchange. And some users said that's a fair trade-off in many cultures and in many age groups it was an immediate trade-off and some it was not, but you could understand the composition of the trade-off <laughs> And the technology behind it was quite primitive compared to today. Now we have the itch situation. I, pardon me for my uh, my dog in the background there. Um, and um, we have a situation now where people um, cannot understand the technology. And the Cambridge Analytic example, just to, to explain how, how, how that really drove the conversation is, it went from saying Facebook is allowing them to use my data to target me on Facebook. And people said, I get that. To Facebook is allowing them to use my data to target me outside of Facebook. And it's like, oh, I didn't know about that. That wasn't part of the deal. So then the extreme case, which is Facebook is allowing them to use my friend's data, who never even agreed to anything, to be targeted outside of the network. And that extreme example showed people that their fears about bad actors doing things with technology that they had no idea was possible that was really a worst case scenario that has helped to drive this perception. So it's it's a very um, a very important topic. This idea of technology improvements, but perception being subjective, giving a different story. But um, in a way, taking over the data or self sovereign identity, um, I think we still have also a way to go. Um, yes, blockchain hasn't solved it yet, but I would also say due to the matter that it's not there yet, that we don't haven't seen yet the adoption of all the possibilities that um, are given now into our hands with this uh, great technology. And therefore, the question will also be when uh, people are um, having to deal with taking ownership again of their data, And that's responsibility. And that's sometimes a UI UX that isn't easy to use. And the question will be, even if it is possible that I can decide on where my data is hosted, where my data is going for, how long, with whom is it shared, uh, with whom not, um, how much do I disclose really about me personally? Um, as, as long as this, you know, this data management um, isn't solved in a, in a, in a, easy to use your iox i think adoption of blockchain technology that could enable this is uh, going to have a hard time so it's also about you know how to design it to make it easy of use as it was easy to use us to give away our data um, in in the interfaces of facebook and instagram and so on uh, how can we take it over again and make it easy to use and handle and manage for us. I think that's the biggest challenge. Is that something that, I mean, I'd be interested to, uh, to hear how well that's improved, um, that, that, that ability, because, you know, just as we're talking, I was remembering 
we set up a way um, back in, you know, 2009, a long time ago, we set up an online tool for any user on Yahoo to come in and see what is Yahoo doing with my data? What are they tracking? Um, it was quite radical at the time. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about what we're going to show people. But we gave them the ability to do it. But, of course, the reality is how many people would actually go in and look at the form and say, actually, I don't want you to do this or that. Um, is it, is, do we think it's easier now? I can then overcome people's resistance to spend the time to do it. I mean, I just, you know, I do it really nearly every day on Google because they are asking me at every day again, you know, which data I want to share. And I'm always having to click. So this, not this, not this, not this. It takes me, you know, probably a, a good a minute <laughs> to, you know, uh, um, take uh, the right measurements, uh, what they shouldn't see and shouldn't care about. And so I think uh, usually users who are not so... Um, I don't know, so into it and, and caring about their data, they don't do it. And um, therefore, there should be something easy to use where you click it once. This is how you can use my data. And that's it. And it's kind of uh, taking care um, that this isn't happening. But I, I do it every day. And it's not easy to use still, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll, make, they'll make it as difficult as, uh, as, as possible. To, yeah. uh, to do that, but you know, I think the 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 challenge nowadays, and and Terry, thank you for your thoughts and given your experience at Yahoo. Um, you know, I I uh, I took a sabbatical leave from MIT and I was at Facebook for two years, right in the middle of Cambridge Analytica, uh, and also have worked with Apple on the privacy team. Uh, I clearly don't represent the views of the company; these are just my personal views. Uh, is that the challenge actually comes more from the data aggregators and not the companies that are using it at the end. So I'm not defending, you know, the big tech players, but at least they're using it for their own purposes, for their own products. Uh, the problem is the data aggregators, the middle layer, who sucks up our data from all the way from telecom and banking to online activity to all the way down to kind of physical layers like your loyalty cards, you know, your school admissions and all those pesky forms you fill up, you know, when you visit a mom and pop shop. So they are taking all this data and, and feeding it to to other players. Uh, and because of regulation uh, and also kind of a pushback from even big tech players, that middle layer is actually disappearing. I know in Japan, they came down very heavily uh, two years ago to eliminate the data aggregators. Uh, but that's not enough because... Now, big tech companies are creating their own consortium saying, mm, OK, players like Google and Amazon have a very detailed profile of a given individual because it's such a vast platform. But if you're a really small player, you know, uh, if you're Robin Hood, then you just don't have a view of your user outside their financial activities. You know, if you're Amazon, you know what you buy, what you watch, where you go. Uh, but the small companies do. So they are trying to create a consortium. Uh, to do that. So it's nice for, nice for us to hear from Google and Amazon, not from Amazon yet, but we hopefully will, that they will not, you know, re-share their data with anybody else because they just have such a ex uh, expansive view of us. So that's kind of one viewpoint, which is it's just not enough to say you'll use it for your own purposes. So even if they show you to your point that, hey, this is what the data we're keeping track of you, that's still not enough. Uh, and on the other hand, to me, privacy is not just about the privacy of an individual, but it's also organizational privacy and also national security. Uh, there have been many instances where, you know, one company can go and buy the data of the employees of a competing company. Saying, hey, I just want to know where, you know, just a GPS location, GPS trails of the people in this other company. And that, as you can imagine, is ex very explosive because it tells you which deals you're making, how many, how many employees you have, which time zones they live in, yeah. and all that stuff. And you can create a very detailed profile of how your competitor is doing. And of course, you can take the same concept at the national security level to say, hey, I just want to track, you know, all the fighter pilots uh, in the in you know a, another country. That's all. Yeah. Not much more information. So we have this this trade-off between are we working with tech players and their aggregators or are we working at individual layer or organizational layer or the national security level? And most of the challenges are not solved even by doing consent or even blockchain because blockchain is just 
you know, pseudo anonymity, not anonymity. Cool. Hi. Maybe you can give us an insight mentioning Japan. Um, What's uh, what's going on there, and what innovations have you seen um, during, especially during times like these? Uh, sure, uh, I think uh, uh, we are in a turning point this moment. Even the, we set the specific rules, such as the uh, privacy regulations. A lot of company has to comply with the uh, baseline. It's not just uh, details, right? That's a very big problem. I used to work with uh, at the one big e-commerce company so far. Uh, they are collecting many data, uh, such as the consumer purchasing data, and also they are tracking on websites or their uh, traffic records and many things that we can see it. This is a very big problem because uh, the older data is uh, relies on the uh, corporate management, such as the access control. Uh, each employer is kind of easy to access those data if those barriers is been disclosed. So this is the corporate cultures and the corporate management is also the requirement. Uh, for example, uh, in, uh, the yesterday, uh, Japanese, uh, big, uh, messaging apps, the line, actually they originated from the South Korea. Uh, they are suspicious to outsourcing their uh, customer data to the sub countries, such as in China or South Korea. This is a very big issues. Even they are promised through the privacy policies. Uh, this was not been written on the document. So those kind of the customer communication is uh, very suspicious, not just for the technical issues, but also this is the relationship with the customers. Uh, from my perspective, the trust mean is not uh, just a strict regulations. It's a requirement of corporate management. Uh, from that perspective, we have to establish the corporate cultures, the corporate management processes. Uh, from my idea, it's not being strict. Is there needs to be a self-governance, such as the uh, corporate members need to understand the linings of the uh, ethical approach. Uh, this is uh, very important to be educated, uh, to reflect, uh, the, uh, the position as uh, your customers. So this is uh, very important. And they also, we have to make a uh, more direct communication to the one customers. It is not the bulk of the customers. So the privacy policy is a uh, very uh, template style. It's a uh, very complex. This is a uh, very hard to understanding for the customer side. So we have to change the ideas, uh, not just uh, uh, rely on the just uh, regulations, but we also have uh, try to customize the uh, customer communications, especially uh, the uh, the the endpoint of the customer relationship. So this is a very uh, important uh, to take some initiatives from the corporate management uh, to make a uh, trust uh, build a customer relationship. Super interesting. Um, super interesting. Thanks, Koi, for um, giving us these insights. Um, it is, uh, I would say, it of course uh, all started with uh, the internet or with us using the World Wide Web. So Tim Berners-Lee, who gave it to all of us um, to make it usable in, in, in a better user-friendly way. Um, have you all heard about his um, push into decentralizing the web? And uh, with his uh, current new project of Inrupt and Pods and giving data back to the people. For me, the question is, um, have you heard about his project? What are your thoughts around it? And are there any other um, projects that will help us um, to bring more trust into the digital world? Yeah, I think if I can, if I can join in there, um... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Good. perfectly. Yeah, I think I think you know uh, Tim is you know my colleague here at MIT, and uh, you know I, I, and uh, projects like Solid uh, and others are are extremely powerful. And the idea that you might be able to create your digital twin um, uh, in in Tim's case, and that you can have some kind of you know some abilities to assign uh, access to your digital twin uh, and even trade for it is a very powerful concept. The challenge with many of these ideas of uh, you know how they would uh, how they would manifest is that it's very 
difficult for an individual to figure out for the digital twin, you know, uh, for the sports, how to assign these, these, uh, you know, access control rights. Um, and, um, and so that's, so we're basically just kicking the can as opposed to clicking the, all those options, uh, in Chrome of what Google has access to you or not. Now we're doing it for everybody, for every company that's out there. Um, so I think, I think there's some challenges in, centralizing your identity into a power. So I think we have a lot of ideas like these uh, to go forward. And I think that we have kind of gone through three phases. Uh, as Terry said, I think in the beginning, it was about, it was very transactional. You know, hey, you come to my platform, I collect your data, I give you something in return. Then we moved into an area of analytics, which is, hey, it's not just about you. I'm going to look at people like you or your friends and I'm going to create some services for you. Now we are in a third phase, which is it's really about AI and machine learning. It's about, hey, I have created some models of behaviors of people and you know sensors and so on, and I'm going to use your data to train a model to provide services to others. So when we come to the AI and machine learning world, uh, this notion of consent, this notion of you know uh, 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 whether you uh, capture somebody's data or not are very very different, right? So this is almost the difference between cash and the stock market. So now we're in the stock market world of of data privacy. So in the AI and machine learning world, what we think is it's more important to create privacy preserving computation and not just privacy of an individual. And and in privacy preserving computation, it's not just about re-identification risk for privacy but it's also re-identification of the data itself. So the, the onus is going up. You know, there was a time when as long as I don't re-identify you, I can use anonymity or pseudo-anonymity, that's good enough. And that's true even for blockchain and cryptocurrency. But that's not enough because even being able to reconstruct the data is important in terms of privacy. So if I'm a hospital uh, and I have a X-ray images, just X-ray images of millions of patients, I'm not willing to just give away those chest X-ray images, even if they don't re-identify who the patients are. So in this AI and machine learning world, two techniques have emerged. One is called federated learning by Google, and another one called split learning, actually from our group here at MIT. And techniques like these will probably become you know, the workhorse of the online world of a privacy-preserving AI and privacy-preserving machine learning. Interesting. I, I, um, I was just thinking uh, while you were, you were speaking, um, I was the um, this idea. I'm not I'm not familiar in detail with with Tim's proposal, but I'm already made a note. I need to uh, to look up, look at it a lot more and, and understand it. But I, I think the idea is, is very interesting. I, I think that one of the issues is um, we have kind of we already have different types of internet um, and. Um, I'm trying to remember who who um, who told me this definition, but um, it was someone else that I'm just repeating. But this idea that we kind of have four different types of internet: we have the Silicon Valley internet, which is innovation is everything. We'll get to regulation later, i.e., privacy and all the things we're talking about, because innovation comes first, and that's what drove so much of, of what we've been talking about in a positive sense, but also led to some negative things. Then you have um, the European view of the internet. The European internet is regulation is table stakes. Let's try to innovate once we've got regulation working. But regulation is more important because people's data and rights, et cetera, are more important than innovation. Um, so it's just flipping the coin. Then you have, let's say, the Washington, Washington DC view, which might be the internet is mainly there as a commercial platform, which drives the economic development. So let's make sure it is done in a way that it can drive economic development and if the innovation and regulation come in afterwards. And then we have the fourth one, which is, of course, a bit scary, which is totalitarian Internet. Um, and in certain markets and countries where um, uh, the Internet has a, a the primary point is the control of what's going on and then the rest can come after that. So it's really four different types. And that is definitely going to have a big impact on how people trust because we all move in different parts of that. You know, many of us may move in all four of those different internets um, and have a different experience and a different perception of how our data is being used, what our rights are there, and what we can trust and what we cannot trust. 
that, that I think that plays quite a significant role. Absolutely, very, very interesting point. Kohai, you wanted to add something to this? Yeah, actually, I haven't read uh, his idea so far, but uh, I'm a personally working on the identity fields the almost uh, three, uh, two years. Uh, from my point is identity control is uh, uh, is a requirement to be a smarters to uh, choose their own uh, direction. So this is a very hard for the old individual to control, such as they have to uh, administrate it, their uh, own private key. Uh, if they lose the keys, they won't be able to connect to the any services or the identity. So this is a big issue. We have to solve the problem as well. Then the, also the some identifiers need to provide a more uh, standard services. Uh, those requirements is a very really, uh, hard to uh, orchestrate it in a short moment. Um, so those technology is in the beginning uh, for the next internet, such as uh, uh, those innovation is a requirement to educate uh, the developers and the users uh, because uh, unless we will uh, make more highly educated uh, the people to use the internet, uh, we will see the more some misinformations or biases or uh, abusement. Uh, good example is a Japanese Twitter. We are treating a lot, the many blaming the people online. In the COVID cases, a lot of the people is suffering from those uh, misperceptions. I think the internet is uh, requires new educations from the many different perspectives, such as do we have to provide a psychology approach, then social approach, the many approaches requirement, not just only for the tech things. Uh, I involved with some of the open source project. Uh, there was uh, many people is uh, coming from uh, different parties. So those placements is uh, uh, required for the next internet to make an sale. I think uh, Tim Banner's project will be going direct there. And a lot of the mm -hmm. other project is the following the same directions for the next internet. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are already coming to an end of our session. It could go on and on. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of uh, Clayton Christensen, who wrote the book about disruptive technologies. And he stated that the next big thing in tech always looks like a toy, um, which means uh, at the end, it needs to be very easy to use, maybe underestimated first uh, to really reach its full potential. We need something, a toy really that is handling our uh, data privacy. And uh, I think until we have not um, reached that status or that state, it will be pretty difficult for the people to manage and to get a better idea how they should handle it and what they should allow and what not. Uh, I thank everyone so much for this session. It was way too short. I would have loved to hear more. I'm, I can't wait to connect with all of you also on LinkedIn and everywhere else and hope to see you soon in another session. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Horasis, for making this possible. Thanks, Frank, as always. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you, you. To Frank, indeed.